Hello and welcome to uh, this talk, Ceph Explained with Raspberry Pis. Uh, my name is uh, Sven Seberg. I am working for SUSE in the documentation team. And today, yeah, I want to use Raspberry Pis to explain Ceph at, le at least a little. Um, the problem initially, I thought, yeah, well, Raspberry Pis could be used. They do not fit the system requirements, but they do not miss that far, but okay. I thought I could use them. And then I started building the slides and I wanted to put a recommendation there that they are they should not be used for production purposes. And now my conclusion after running the first test is you shouldn't use them for any purposes except um, running LEDs on them. Okay. And uh, I want to emphasize that I'm not a Ceph expert or anything like that. I'm just having fun with Raspberry Pis and deploying a Ceph cluster. But um, I will try to explain the core concepts of Ceph with the help of the LEDs attached to the Raspberry Pis. Okay, and as this is a live demo, um, here's the warning, it is a live demo. Don't expect it to work, at least all the time. And I know that some of the things I did here with LEDs could also be done with uh, several monitoring tools, for example, OpenEttic, but uh, for the heck of it, I used LEDs. Okay, um, if there are question, questions to, uh, during the talk, please feel free to ask anytime and remind me to repeat it for the microphone. I uh, do not want to talk about how you set up your Ceph cluster at home. I don't want to explain how to administrate it. And I, I'm not going into detailed information about the features. I'm just going to uh, explain the general um, ideas behind Ceph. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. There are some other, to other talks um, on Sunday. For example, Joshua has a talk at 11 a.m. Uh, about how to de deploy a Ceph cluster with a salt. I recommend going there if you want to set up your own Ceph cluster at home. And Abby and Dennis are to uh, talking about how to monitor your Ceph cluster with um, Elasticsearch. Okay, now what is Ceph? Uh, well, this, these uh, bullet points are basically uh, on every slide that is introducing Ceph. Um, it's software design, uh, defined storage, it's open source, highly scalable. Um, the developers claim it's scaling into the petabytes and it actually does. Um, you can run hundreds of gigabyte, terabytes or even hundreds of petabytes of storage with a Ceph. Uh, the interesting part is that you can use, let's say, commodity hardware, but not as commodity as Raspberry Pis. And yeah, um, the whole thing is self-healing managing. What that means, uh, I will explain later. And the other um, interesting part, and that all, uh, already saved my ass a few times, um, it's, it doesn't have a single point of failure. So some of the pies already crashed and I could manage to, re uh, it, it continued to run. Okay, and Ceph is finally something that barely runs on Raspberry Pis. Um, another word about Ceph in general, it does not magically solve all storage problems. You really need to know what um, your requirements are and you need to um, define your cl uh, cluster requirements accordingly. Now before uh, I start um, talking about the concepts and demonstrating a few things, I want to... Um, is the microphone volume okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I first want to give a, a short introduction into the different nodes that are um, used in a, resp uh, in a Ceph cluster, um, especially the two I'm using right now that are the OSD and monitor nodes. Um, the other ones that are usually associated with uh, Ceph clusters um, are in theory available in here, but I did not have the time to set them up, so we are going not to use them. Um, first of all, there are the uh, OSDs, the ob uh, object storage devices, the Ceph OSD. OSD is short for object storage device. And the OSD daemon is the daemon that is handling the raw disk, so to speak. Um, they actually store the data in the cluster. They always communi communicate with each other and they take care that 
data is replicate, replicated within the cluster. So um, I can say I want three replications of each object in the cluster, and they will automatically um, do that. And if one node fails, they will take another node and duplicate the data there. So I always have the three replications available. And they also, yeah, I already mentioned that basically. They uh, see failures of other OSDs and begin replicating data again. Um, the OSD is the daemon that is um, managing the data on a disk, or it could potentially be two disks. One is uh, used for the data, the other one is used for the journal of the data, uh, for the object stored on a data disk. Um, you can have both partitions on one hard drive. Um, it is usually recommended to put the journal on an SSD and the data on uh, magnetic drive that is much slower. Um, in this case, I'm using very slow USB drives and the perf uh, performance is accordingly. Okay. Um, the monitor nodes um, are used uh, to track the status of the cluster. So they always know which nodes are available in the cluster and um, exchange um, this map called a uh, crush map but I will talk about this later, um, between each other. So they always um, communicate with each other about the current status of the cluster. And they usually decide, or not usually, they decide by majority uh, which uh, map or which version of the map is the current map and the right version. And that's um, that why I have uh, three large racks, I call them racks of Raspberry Pis in here. Um, yeah about that in a few uh, minutes. Okay. And then the other ones, uh, for example, the metadata server is used for, uh, if you want to export a file system that is POSIX compatible, you could use the metadata server or Redis Gateway um, basically provides an REST API to the object stored in the cluster. And now to uh, give you an insight into the setup of the nodes here, um, I had to swear a lot during the last days I'm setting this whole thing up and yeah, my colleagues um, began um, changing cluster f to cluster fake. And yeah, that's how I'm calling it right now um, because it's not really a self cluster. Um, okay, at the top of each rack there's a monitor node. Um, uh, there are three monitor nodes because they always need a majority to decide. And if you have, for example, four nodes and one node fails, then three nodes can still decide um, about a new version of the map. But um, if the sec if a second one fails, then there is no majority and therefore there's no real advantage uh, over having just uh, three nodes. So you can always have just one failure in any case. So um, therefore I'm using uh, three monitor nodes. And um, in my theoretical setup, I wanted to put them each in one rack and maybe distribute the racks in different rooms in my data center and therefore have a pretty good um, availability in case of power failures in one room, for example. Okay, and then the, on the lower left, the two nodes are currently unused. Um, the upper left node is used as an administrator node um, and you're going to see what is going on later on there. And then there are some nice LEDs I wanted to show uh, on the webcam. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that is working later on. And you can see the LEDs. Um, there are currently uh, three different um, uh, yeah, traffic lights, basically. And um, you see the there are always three LEDs on the top nodes, and they like any traffic light. Red is not good, yellow is okayish, and green is good. And for the admin node, that means the whole cluster is fine. And for the other three, uh, that means uh, yellow, they agreed, just agreed on a new map. And on, when, they are, when one is red, that basically means that something is wrong and green, everything is fine. And it will show a heartbeat all the time. And then there are um, other LEDs on each storage node. Red um, may, uh, currently means, oh, uh, so it's uh, correct. Red means write and green LED means uh, currently the device is reading. And yeah, 
I'm hoping you can see the colors later on. Um, before I am going into the details about how Ceph is handling all the data and going to demonstrate that, um, a few um, other things about how you can access the data um, and how Ceph is basically handling all that. Um, all data in Ceph is basically stored in objects. Objects reside somewhere called pools and you can access the objects in the pools via REST, for example, the Redis gateway I earlier mentioned. You can also use the Ceph file system and you can also export um, actual block devices and there are other tools that allow exporting iSCSI and so on. Um, I'm going to use uh, for this demonstration a command line tool called Redos that is directly interacting with the cluster. And there are also um, libraries available in many programming languages that allow you to write programs that directly interact with the cluster. Okay, how does uh, Ceph manage all the things, um, scaling into petabytes and not have any single point of failure? And I think this, there are many talks about this and I'm having another run at it. And yeah, the thing responsible for this is called um, CRUSH, um, Controlled Scalable Decentralized Placement of Replicated Data. And um, CRUSH is an algorithm-based approach to storing data. And it does not require a lot of information to calculate where the data should be stored. Um, it just needs the name of the object to be stored. It needs to know the pool, the logical partition, where to store the data. And it requires a current status of the cluster, uh, which nodes are available and if they're online or offline. And then you can also place some constraints on the cluster. For example, in the setup, I would like to have um, one replication of each object on each rack. So if one room goes offline or one rack goes offline, for example, when I plug off power supply, then one rack goes offline. And um, yeah, uh, I'm going to let it run for a couple of minutes because Raspberry Pis are slow and they will take some time to realize that some nodes are gone. Uh, okay, you already see the, oh, no, you can't see it, sorry. No, you can't see it still, you still can't see it. You see that the yellow LED is running right now, that blinking, that means that they realize something is wrong, but it will still take some time. Okay, let's continue. Um, then there are the user-defined constraints on the placement, as mentioned, and they are written in something called the crush map. And yeah, so I already started with the first demonstration. Um, I unplugged one of the racks, and um, what you probably can see, no, you can't because, okay. So now you can see that uh, the Raspberries here in those racks are not doing a lot. That's because, ah, now they're, no, can you see it that they are blinking here? Yeah, sort of, okay, now now they start blinking. Yeah, that's what should happen. Um, now they realize that the, all the uh, nodes here are gone and the replications are not, they're not as uh, replications available anymore. So they start um, copying the still existing replications of data to other nodes so that I regain my uh, three total replications I wanted to have in the cluster. Um, the cluster status during that time is not very healthy and that is uh, signaled by the currently red LED. Um, yeah, so there are two different um, statuses of the Ceph cluster, one is error, one is worn, that are not good, but error does not mean that it's not, that it's crashing. Error can also mean it just takes some time to recover. So red does not mean that it's totally failing. Okay. Um, now, you want to store the data in something uh, like partitions, having all data objects in one partition is not very useful. For example, you want to grant user rights to different parts of the cluster, and that is um, achieved by the things called pools, as mentioned previously. Um, now you may think, wow, I know partitions, easy stuff. And yeah, basically it is. Um, the pools are, from the outside, acting like Mo 
yeah, very similar to petitions. Um, you can, for example, create snapshots. Um, and yeah, you can define rules uh, for each pool. For example, the replication level, you can say this pool should have three replication, the other one only two. And then there are different modes for replications. I will talk about this later. Um, now, that's not all. Inside, there is something called placement groups. And the placement groups are basically helping Ceph to organize the data within the cluster. Um, if you have thousands or millions of objects in one pool, um, each node has to know or should, in theory, be able to calculate where each object is currently stored. And this is very expensive uh, in calcul uh, CPU time. Therefore, the complexity is reduced with the placement groups. And the placement groups are just groups of objects packed together, um, and they are put together based on their names. So um, the, there's something like a hash function that is deciding which uh, placement group an object resides in. And each placement group then uses a defined set of OSDs to store the data. Yeah, and uh, placement groups are one of the most important, um, maybe the most important um, uh, performance factor. Okay, um, so when I want to store an object in a cluster, I decide I want to put it in pool A or pool B. Um, the pools then are divided into a number of placement groups. Um, there are some, yeah, you have to calculate it de depending on the number of nodes you're having in your cluster, but I'm not going into this right now or not in this talk. And then um, the Ceph is creating the hash of the file name, deciding, well, this file goes into placement group one of the uh, pool or placement group two of the pool or maybe another placement group um, when I'm putting it in another pool. Um, the OSDs can be used by several placement groups at the same time, so there is no need that just one placement group is using one node, uh, OSD, um, and it, for performance reasons it's even better to have multiple um, placement groups on one node. Uh, the average should be around 150. Okay, and then there are some neat things going on. When I begin writing of an object into one placement group um, or to a specifically one OSD. The client knows which use the OSD it needs to contact and store the object on. And then the OSD um, knows that it has to create two other replications of the object and begins writing those replications to other nodes. And as soon as um, the repli replications are finished and the writing on of all three objects or repli replications is finished, then um, the primary OSD, that's the one that was contacted at the beginning, um, sends a signal back to the client that the object has been successfully stored. And so this is not that fast because um, I first need to contact one um, OSD, this one needs to contact two other, or maybe more or less, depends on your configuration, and needs to write all the stuff, and then afterwards it can send the finished signal. Um, on the other hand, reading is much better because um, when you, your client does not only know the primary um, node it can contact, but also knows um, all the other nodes that store the replications of the object. So they can, um, by themselves, just choose any uh, other node contacted and read the object from there. So that makes a parallel reading very efficient. Um, yeah, so about the placement groups, um, As I mentioned before, they just reduce the complexity of tracking each object and reduce calculating the time where, where the object resides. And um, they are uh, impacting the performance because as soon as one uh, node fails, the data has to be um, duplicated again or replicated somewhere else. Uh, so uh, when the other nodes realize that one node is gone, then they begin checking, well, I. I'm also having replications of this specific placement group, and then they are contacting other nodes and putting all the stuff they are they have stored in the placement groups that are now um, do not have enough replications. They will begin storing this uh, data, these uh, placement groups on other nodes as well. And 
Um, depending on your cluster size, um, well, if you have a few placement groups per node, then you can this node can only contact five, six, seven other um, OSDs, for example, if you have only seven placement groups on one node, it can just contact seven other, at most, seven other OSDs and begin writing um, this data to seven other uh, nodes, for example. Uh, if you have much more uh, placement groups, on the other hand, um, then at some point it's not imp improving the performance anymore. You know, uh, okay, I have to uh, mention that writing usually takes longer than reading. So while one uh, node is pushing all the data, the other ones have to write. And um, yeah, so the bottleneck is usually the writing. And the more the no to the more other nodes the uh, remaining OSD can write, the faster the process is. At some point, of course, the network is the bottleneck, therefore having more placement groups does not improve performance. But um, then you begin having other problems. Having too many um, placement groups is also, again, very expensive uh, on the computing side. Okay, now I'm hoping, no. Okay, so that's the, the thing with live demos is beginning to start. And usually it should not take that long to... Okay, I have to plug it in again. Um, okay, let's see what's going to happen. Um, now, as soon as the raspberries come online again, then... Okay, maybe I can just uh, explain currently what's going on. I need to put aside the chameleon and I need to change the view and I make maybe can put it in full screen. Okay, so currently there are two uh, OSDs remaining, the ones over here, and you see that the two uh, green LEDs are blinking. That means um, they are still more than 50% of the monitors are available, and they can still um, decide what is going about what is going on in the cluster. And um, yeah, so as soon as the, the now the new nodes are coming online, and you see they will soon contact the remaining nodes. And then the, uh, the thing that uh, one of the selling points of Ceph uh, come in and now the cl uh, cluster is beginning to redistribute the data. So you can see that um, the nodes in here are beginning to read and write and um, those nodes over here will receive um, all the data that has been changed or yeah moved during the time they were offline. So now the data is uh, rebalanced over all nodes and after a few minutes um, the cluster should be back to its original state because I did not change that. Yeah, not the original state, state but um, the data basically should be back where it was before I took the one rack offline. Okay. And yeah. While this is going on, I can continue. Um, so there are two different modes of how Ceph handles the repli replications. One are one mode is called replicate. Yeah, is used in replicated pools. That's basically what I was talking about of, uh, the whole time. And then there's another thing um, because replications are expensive on the storage side. You need um, if you have uh, three replications, you need three times the storage. Uh, you need for just storing the file once or object once. Um, and yeah, that co just costs a lot of money if you have a lot of data. And then you can also do something that is similar to RAID, uh, to RAID 5 or 6. You split your data object into chunks and you create parity um, chunks for the data. So you can, for example, split your object in two chunks and create one parity chunk, then you can have uh, one failure, you can, you, you can um, maintain the, uh, the cluster with one failure. So the data is still available when one uh, cluster, fa uh, one rack fails or one node fails. But um, if another node fails, then the data is not available anymore. Uh, in contrast to the replicated pool where one surviving copy is enough to have the data still available. And that means in this case, if I want to store the data in replicated pools. I will ta have to use uh, three times the uh, storage I the file usually uses. And if I use an uh, erasure-coded pool, it just uses 
when I uh, use this configuration that I want to split the file into two parts, I have one parity chunk, then I will use only 50% uh, overhead of my uh, disks for storing the data. But um, that ca this ca uh, comes at a cost. If I want to read now um, this data from the OSDs, I need to contact at least two OSDs, um, fetch the data from both, and then calculate or put my file back together uh, with uh, CPU, uh, so it to cost CPU time. Um, reading data from much more CPU time, reading data from erasure coded pools than from replicated pools. Um, when writing data to replicated pools, um, it also takes a lot of bandwidth in the back end, so the file is written to one OSD, this has to contact two others or four others or maybe just one other OSD, so it produces a large load on the back, uh, back end network. Um, but, yeah, um, sorry, uh, I lost myself. Um, uh, to erasure codes. Yeah, and uh, on the other hand, um, you can have more efficient data use, uh, storage usage uh, and trade this off against CPU time. Okay, now it's not working for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, let's have a look. And this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't do live. Okay. Uh, and all my tests, well, it looks, no, it doesn't look fine. Um, yeah, so it's still, yeah, okay. Um, some um, pools are broken. I will just delete them for the sake of the demonstration. And I need to put away the microphone for a second. Okay, now um, the pools should be removed and um, it should take another couple of minutes. Ah, now, okay, now the cluster screen again. So the, uh, it's restored. I can now create new pools. Um, okay, um, failure handling. Um, so in order to do all the things uh, Seth promises it can do, um, you need some user interaction. You need to, when, when you just install Ceph, it treats every node uh, similar to each uh, to an, any other node it just puts the data on any node that is available if you want for example to have data distributed over different racks you have to manually tell the cluster well these nodes reside in one rack the other nodes in another rack and maybe you have a third rack and those racks can be in rows of racks and the ra rows can again be in rooms or data centers so you can basically um, define the full structure you have in your data center and um, yeah, uh, therefore distribute or the data everywhere in your different rooms and guarantee a high availability. And this is done uh, with the crash map. And the crash map, that's when you decompile it, it's just a text file where you can say, well, these um, OSDs belong to one thing called bucket and these buckets are in a hierarchy so one can reside in another bucket and these are basically the things that are the racks, the nodes and upper level are data center rooms and so on. Okay, now what's going um, on when, no sorry, not what's going on I already mentioned. Um, now when devices fail in I already mentioned that, I can jump over the slide. Um, now, I can um, put data on different um, pools and I can define for each pool, well, and for th this data and this pool is not that important, I just want two replications because um, I don't want to waste uh, my storage for them and I can decide, well, other um, objects are much more import important, maybe I want 
to have uh, four replications. And then on the other hand, I can also use the erasure coded pools to do this whole thing more um, storage efficient. Um, now, if I use, um, I, if I can, uh, don't define uh, any structure for the cluster, the advantage is that every other node can be used for replication. So if one node fails, any other node can jump in and can be used for replacing the failed node. Um, if I, on the other hand, begin um, defining um, another structure, maybe Rex in this case, um, and I am telling the cluster, well, um, put one object in the first rack, one object, uh, one replication in the second rack, and the third replica replication in the third rack, and one rack fails, then basically not all nodes are available for replication. Or if maybe just one node fails in the third rack, only the two remaining nodes in the third rack are available for a replication. Therefore, um, there are some disadvantages uh, for uh, using this, but disadvantages, with disadvantages maybe going a little too far. Um, you have to provision your cluster uh, and taking this into account. So you need enough uh, remaining nodes available. Um, more important is uh, are the monitor nodes. You usually do not have that many monitor nodes in your cluster. And um, one scenario might be that you have two st uh, server rooms in your um, building and you have uh, maybe two um, monitors in one room and three monitors in the other room. Now, if the room with the uh, three monitors goes offline, then basically your cluster is stuck. It cannot operate anymore. And so you usually should have a third side where, well, uh, some monitors reside and you have two and two in each server room and maybe a fifth uh, monitor in s another location that is available or connected to both other locations. So it's uh, acting as a tiebreaker in case of one room fails. Okay, so um, if I'm using, um, if I'm distributing my objects uh, over different racks, uh, I am also having the advantage that, uh, for example, if the infrastructure fails, the switch that is connecting the whole rack or the power supply unit that is supplying the whole rack uh, is going offline, then um, the cluster is still able to operate normally. Um, of course, it takes some time to um, redistribute the data. You already saw that uh, when I plugged off the um, power supply for the uh, third rack. It takes, yeah, well, in this case, it took much more because the cluster um, yeah, failed totally. And I can try again. Maybe it's going to work this time. But no, I'm not going to, to do this. I'm just going to take away uh, one. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, not that hard to it right now. Um, okay, so I just took one node offline, and uh, what should happen is um, I took the upper node here and the third rack offline, and uh, at some point the other nodes again should realize that this node is gone, and you will see that the red and green LEDs uh, start. No, this is not the thing that now it's going to start. Now you see that they begin blinking a lot, and um, they begin redistributing the data that was stored on the uh, third node, uh, first node on the class, uh, third rack, and yeah, storing it on the remaining nodes. And of course, um, they have to read it from uh, the nodes in the other racks. Uh, oh, and yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. And um, then there's uh, one thing that is important when um, using um, those different pools, um, erasure coded and replicated pools. Um, if you, you if you're using an, a replicated pool, it does not matter which. No, it does matter which node replaces the node that is gone. Um, if you want, if if the first node fails, that is the primary node that is contacted in case someone wants to write an object to the pool, um, then you want. If this first node goes goes offline, you want another node that already has all copies to immediately jump in. So what you're doing is you're queuing all the uh, OSDs that are used for the placement group, and uh, as soon as one uh, uh, OSD fails, like in here, um, they are all um, jumping in one uh, place ahead in the queue. And then the uh, next um, OSD is used to replicate the data there. 
and this is especially important if the first node fails and then the second node is immediately there and can continue operating the cluster or the pool, sorry. And more specific, the placement group. This is uh, done on the placement group level. Um, on the other hand, if you are using an uh, erasure coded pool, the position of the OSDs in the um, is important. That means uh, if the object is split uh, split into different uh, into chunks. Then the first part is stored in the first OSD, the second part in the second OSD, and so on. And now, um, if one uh, node fails, they should not change the position because then all the uh, chunks have to be moved to the new uh, to new um, nodes in the placement group. And therefore, what you would like to do is you just replace the failed node with any other node that is somewhere in the cluster and you begin replicating the data on this new node. So it, you, you do not want to change the order of the remaining nodes because that would mean additional time moving data within the placement group or placement groups. Um, okay, um, I think I'm already pretty much, um, yeah, okay. Um, I will just plug that in right again. And sorry, the demonstration part came a little short because it took too much time to recover from the first failure. And yeah, so um, just to give you some uh, insight what the raspberries are capable of, um, I, ran the I ran some performance tests and you can write around 1.6 megabytes per second uh, into the cluster. I did not do any read tests uh, because I did not have time. Um, it's nice for displaying on the LEDs what is happening, but um, performance-wise, it's really bad. So you do not want to use it even at home for playing around. And yeah. What you can also do um, with uh, the different sorts of pools, you can uh, do something that is called cache tiering. You can for use an EC pool uh, in the background and put a replicated pool in front of it and all objects that are um, written to this cache uh, tiered pool um, first uh, will be put into the replicated pool and they reside there for some period of time and then um, at some point they will be written to the cold uh, storage uh, to the EC erasure, co erasure coded pool. So um, if you when you want to access uh, this object and it uh, it's already in the replicated pool um, that is residing above the uh, erasure coded pool then you can access this file again with uh, several clients from several uh, OSDs at the same time. And only if you're not using this object anymore, it's flushed from the um, from the replicated pool and moved to the. Well, it's always moved to the EC erasure coded pool. But then, um, as soon as it's not important, not that important anymore, and you need it again, then you uh, have to retrieve it from the erasure coded pool. So that's uh, basically a compromise uh, between both worlds. You get some improvements in performance, at least sometimes. Uh, depends heavily on what you actually want to do with that. And you also get some efficiency out of the erasure coded pool storage mechanism. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump over that and I'm going to stop here because I wanted to leave 20 minutes for questions and answers. And if there are no questions and answers, I could um, do some try again uh, to do some demonstrations, but first I want to take questions if there are any. Yeah, there's one. Yes, microphone. Uh, when you offline uh, the third rack. Uh, the, sorry, the what? Well, it's probably not. Uh, uh, when you offline the third rack, uh, and uh, you put it online again, it yes. started writing data, but it already had it. And uh, the uh, OSD uh, should, uh, should have known they have it. I'm, I do not exactly know how that is handled in detail, um, but uh, usually you have to assume that during the time it was offline, at least some of the data changed. So it, 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 it at least needs to compare what happened 
and probably it's doing that, but I'm not sure about, I don't know. Basically, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe someone else in the room does. There are some people involved uh, that could know it, but yeah, I do not. Other questions? like the room and the uh, rack and the uh, notes. So if I have two rooms, look, maybe I understood it wrong, but like, would that also mean like the replication in that room, like, would they cross replicate or if like one yes. room fails? So if I, I need to manually define that. So I can, I have notes in one room and notes in the other room and by itself, uh, Seth will treat each node each equally. With right. equally. Yeah. So it could by accident all uh, uh, replications could land in one room. Right. Right. But um, if I tell Seth, well, these nodes are in one room and these nodes are in the other room, and I tell it I want one at least one replication in each room, so it then it will right. do that. Okay. So, but I have manually right. tell, I have to tell cool. it manually cool. to do so. Okay, any other questions? No, okay. Um, I will maybe go back a few slides and then try to, if you're interested, uh, yeah, to do the, um, where did I lose? The, okay, I think um, what I want to do first is, again, create, I ha I'm not sure whether there is still a, an existing pool in the cluster, I first need to check that. Yeah, so I, I deleted all the pools. So all the demonstration I did after deleting the pools was basically uh, bogus. So I first need to create another pool, and I will just use um, a, new, uh, a replicated pool right now. And of course. Okay, now I'm going to create a pool and um, you will see that the, uh, no you don't because you cannot see the webcam. Um, you see now that the nodes are starting to work and just creating the placement groups uh, on all the nodes already takes some time in the cluster and during the time, um, I'm not sure, no you cannot really see it, the, um, here the yellow LED is on, that means currently the cluster is telling me that it's uh, not really uh, fully available right now. It's, it's working on uh, creating all uh, placement groups that I want to have. So um, I told it to have uh, 128 placement groups in the um, cluster, which is not um, the best thing. Um, for this amount of nodes, you should use more like 512, but for performance reasons with the um, recipes, and yeah, it's just faster creating fewer placement groups. In my experience, I'm not sure, but in the first tests, yeah. Yes? Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, what I'm running on the recipes. Um, I'm running on the Raspberry Pis, I'm running um, the 42.2 uh, choose image and uh, initially I wanted to use the full OpenSUSE um, Ceph packages and I had some trouble in config configuring Ceph um, but I'm not sure whether that was due to me or due to the packages. In the end I uh, decided to use the SLE packages and um, then it worked fine. I, I, now I'm quite confident that it was my um, in that I was not capable of um, configuring it correctly the first time. So um, I'm qu pretty confident that it should work with the OpenSUSE um, packages as well. So yeah, no differences. And I used the Ceph deploy um, scripts to 
uh, set up the cluster because um, there's another thing available called DeepSea that's uh, that are some scripts for salt and um, that takes a long time to execute on the recipes so um, have it using the self deploy is just a little faster in the end and there are not that many nodes that I really need to use salt to manage all the nodes okay yes another question Um, so yeah, you're I'm using the SLEE repositories on OpenSUSE and you're booting the recipes with PXE or? No, um, the operating, so I use the, the juice image that is available for the SD card for Raspberry Pis and flash the um, images to on the SD cards, booted them and then I added the SLEE repository afterwards and uh, used them only to install Ceph and yeah, Ceph deploy. Okay. Any other questions or okay? Okay, uh, now the cluster is finished with creating the uh, place uh, placement groups and the pool, and now I can um, write an object into the um, pool. I will just uh, write the string "Hello World" in an object called test object, and uh, when I hit the enter, you see it already takes a lot of time just to store the string hello world. It took maybe three seconds to do that. And um, I will just move the um, command line over here and the webcam over here. And okay, it's still working on things I do not know exactly. But now when I write the object again, you see the red lights jumping, on, uh, switching on on some nodes. I will maybe turn it a little to this side and you can see the LEDs better. And you see then there's one LED uh, coming online here and ah, it's a reverse. Uh, one here, one here. <laughs> I will just do that again. And you see um, that they are stored actually on the bottom nodes of each rack. So currently, um, the bottom nodes of each rack are used to store the two repli or the three replications of the object. So I will just pull um, the plug on this and this node over here, and um, that could be a problem because maybe I uh, switched off the primary node, and when I want to now read the object. Um, get um, test object test object and write it to the command line. Okay, now yeah, I probably took offline the primary node, and the cluster first needs to realize that the node is gone, and or the, the sorry, not the primary node, but the nodes that uh, the client wanted to contact right now. So. Any case, uh, it takes some time for the pool to um, the placement groups to get up to date, and then the data should basically be available again. Let's wait and see whether that is going to happen. Uh, we can, during that time, just run Ceph status and see what is going on in detail. So, okay, um, yeah. 61 placement groups are still totally fine. Um, another 67 are, well, not good right now. And over time, this should change. Uh, should change. And more and more placement groups should be, uh, should be back up running, yeah. So now, most of them are Activating, that means they're, yeah, now 74 are already uh, back up again. Sorry? On the Raspberry Pis? Yeah. I haven't tried. Um, yeah, because um, in, in 42.3, Calamari will not be supported anymore. So SF deploy neither. So um, you should use DeepC with the next release anyway. Okay, now um, all the uh, basement groups are fine again, and I should be able to read the object. Yeah, there it is. So it's working again. And now you see the reading is actually much faster than writing. 
and I do not have more clients here, but yeah, well, in the end, it should scale. Okay, um, now let's jump back. Oh, what I want to do next, um, and I have to. Okay, uh, I've got a few minutes left, and maybe I will just. Um, hmm. No, I think I will stop here. And if you're interested, just I will go over there. And and if you have uh, have any questions, you can contact me afterwards, and I will free the stage for the next talk. Okay, thank you.